The Space Merchants is a fantastic and fit to be read dystopian novel from Frederick Pohl and C.M. Kornbluth. The story was originally a serial appearing in Galaxy Science Fiction in 1952. Published as The Space Merchants shortly after, this book will evoke Brave New World, 1984, and Fahrenheit 451 vibes. The story is in many ways a satire or warning about rampant consumerism and commercialism, classism, and unchecked corporate power. As with each review on this channel, the episode will begin with a spoiler-free review, character analysis, and plot summary. Following that summary, I'll announce a 5 likes and a 5 dislikes segment that will include spoilers. If you haven't already done so, click the subscribe button and the notification bell before we start. As always, I also appreciate your participation in the comments section. If there are dystopian novels that you really love, please let me know down there in the comments. The author's imagined society has only grown in prescience and realism with time. While the story does not flow as smoothly as those other more popular dystopian classics, its message and warnings are just as profound, even if it's a bit more subtle. Mitchell Courtney is a star-class copyright at Shock & Associates. In a sales-dominated world, this is a very good thing to be. Add to it that Mitch gets the Venus Project, and he's living large. Shock & Associates is the class of the industry, and Mitch is the risingest star. The Venus Project is the most coveted and biggest contract out there. The goal is to sell the idea of colonizing Venus and get butts on the ship going out. Courtney is an absolute company man. He's loyal to a T. He lives and breathes sales and marketing. Writing copy is in his veins. It's in his blood. Borders between advertising firms and really any firm is more significant and relevant in this dystopia than geographic borders are. Shocken and Associates, their prime rival firm is Taunton Associates, another large advertising agency. It's not unheard of, and in fact it's expected, that firms will play dirty to win contracts, and they'll even retaliate against the other firm when a contract is lost. The plot is somewhat clunky and it's not a smooth ride, but it achieves the bare necessary minimum to establish a workable setting and it grounds us in the interesting world that Poole and Cornbluff have imagined. Merchants is a very enjoyable read full of ideas. The commercialism theme is hammered home in a number of ways. Law enforcement is basically non-existent. Instead, individuals can contract and pay private firms to provide investigators or bodyguards. The system of justice beyond that is less clear. The world being dystopian, there aren't many surf and turf dinners or spacious luxury apartments. Instead, we get chicken little and uber genetically modified proteins. Merchants introduces some imaginative and disturbing visuals in regards to harvesting protein. It's not pretty. It's easy to appreciate all the areas of society, industry, and politics that are caught in the author's crosshairs. Multinational conglomerates wield all of the power, and politicians and government agencies are basically figureheads for sale to the highest bidder. Sound familiar? Ad agencies will lie, cheat, and steal to compete with their rivals. Firms will engage in the seediest and lowest forms of advertising techniques, and they're not at all above including addictive substances into the products they market. Just as Fahrenheit 451 has its secret book readers and 1984 has the Brotherhood, so Merchants has its Konzies. The conservationists have infiltrated many of the institutions of society and government and they play a significant role in Courtney's story. Other characters of note in the book are Kathy, Mitchell's sort of wife. She's a doctor and fairly independent minded for most of the book making her somewhat of a unique female representation in 1950s science fiction. The arc of their relationship is central to the story. Fowler Shockin, the CEO of Shockin Associates, is a very clear symbol of corporate dominance. His presence in the novel spotlights the disconnect between the ruling class and everyone else, or rather, the consumers. His willful and blissful ignorance of the realities of the world around him feed the satirical narrative that unchecked corporations Greed and commercialism will be our downfall. Jack O'Shea is a little person. This being 1950, 
He's referred to in the book as being a midget. Also seemingly acceptable in 1950 is the idea of Venus as a potentially habitable planet. O'Shea, because of his stature and thus ability to fit in a rocket designed for an initial trip, is the first person to travel to Venus. This distinction lands him a lucrative consultancy with Shock and Associates, obvious fame, and a budding friendship with Courtenay. Merchants gets quite a bit right. It's relevant, at times funny, at times disjointed, but always engaging and enjoyable. Pull and Cornbluth make their points at times subtly and at times hitting you over the head with it. Space Merchants belongs among the pantheon of important and relevant classic sci-fi dystopian literature. The rest of my review belongs in the spoilery section of this episode, so here we go with my five likes and five dislikes, including spoilers, for the Space Merchants. Dislike number one, quite a bit of misogyny. Not that we're surprised by this type of treatment in 1950s sci-fi, but beyond the typical women's can only be housewives deal, we get quite a dose of slut shaming. That Mitchell's wife is a doctor isn't ignored here, but it doesn't distract from the cringe moments. Like number one, the setup and forged identity, that tragedy that Courtney faces, it comes out of nowhere and it's an exciting turn of events. It served as a huge surprise, but also as a way to really illustrate the terror of this dystopian earth. Dislike number two, Merchants falls just short of the bar set by the big three, Fahrenheit 451, Brave New World 1984. I think of those as the big three dystopian warning novels. Space Merchants offers a profound warning about rampant consumerism and shady marketing practices, but it asks too much of the reader to believe in. The big three are obviously imagined in an exaggerated world, but everything that happens feels right and believable for those made up worlds. Merchants fails at this a few times. Probably the most egregious is Fowler's inability to believe Mitch's story and his warnings. It suits the story and definitely hammers home the profundity of being detached from reality and blind to the injustice of a world dominated by consumerism. It barely lands in the dislike section, but it's a serious double take moment. And frankly, I hate tropes where someone tries to convince everyone else of the truth and how they were duped, and no one believes them, and they can't prove it. It's so stressful. Like number two, the 1984 parallels, it made the world interesting and horrifying. Likewise, there were absolutely Fahrenheit 451 and Brave New World vibes to boot. Like number three, Chicken Little is disgusting and horrifying. It definitely darkens the atmosphere of the story and I'm here for it. Like number four, Mitchell's life as a copysmith is so imbued in him. He sees everything through that lens. A normal person, not in the space merchant's world, would read the slipped Konzi note and have a much different reaction than Mitchell had and his focus on its marketing competency. A normal person wouldn't evaluate the drafter's inspirations. Then there's his ignorance of the cruel world that he lives in. Thinking a certain Konzi was wasted because he could have been an excellent consumer and he felt it a tragedy that he wasn't. Dislike number three. In what world is Runstead kept on the Venus account? This is one of those clunky moments that just doesn't add up. Later we have him heading the firm while Shockin is on the moon. It was as if Runstead became like an inconvenient part of the story and the, they, the authors, just didn't know what to do with the character. Dislike number four. Having the shares of stock transfer to Mitchell via the holdings of the Shell corporations, it had potential to be a really cool reveal. Instead, it was a perfunctory divulgence. Dislike number five. The ending felt rushed and awkward. The involvement of the president was funny and it added to the satire, but it was eye-roll worthy. I mentioned before that they lost control of Remstead in the story. It seems Jack O'Shea was likewise forgotten. Like number five. There were a number of twists and turns. Not all of them worked so well, but it definitely keeps the reader on our toes, making for an exciting ride. An excellent ride it was. Never boring and quite thought provoking. Space Merchants is classic dystopian science fiction. I highly recommend reading it. I'm Michael Leverts. This is fit to be read. Please like, please subscribe. Please click the notification bell and YouTube will let you know every Thursday at 1 o'clock when I release new content. Thank you.